morning everyone hope that you have had an amazing three-day weekend it is Tuesday and that means we have a short week ahead um, and so as promised I'm just trying to continue my study of the prophets um, and so today we're going to talk about Obadiah to recap a few things that I had said last week number one the prophets are God's messengers and the message is typically one of warning for the people, um, but it is a call to repent. And often what they're doing is taking scripture and bringing it forth uh, to, the people's, to the people's mind so that they have a choice to make, um, helping them realize this is judgment, and this is what it looks like if you do not repent, but if you do... Here's all the blessings and the hope and the restoration and the relationship uh, with God that you have waiting and in store for you. So, I learned a few things about Obadiah. The biggest thing I learned is that we don't know a lot about Obadiah. <laughs> he and Joel both uh, are in, um, like, we don't know actually what time period they were in. A big thing with the prophets is, are they pre-exilic, exilic, or post-exilic. And that means at the time that the prophet was speaking, were the people of Israel, you know, in captivity, in exile? Were they, was it right before Assyria and Babylon came? Or was it after in their return? And so often you'll see things referenced uh, like the temple, that's a big part of it. The temple, the land, the kingdom, things like that. So Obadiah, here's what we know. His name means servant of Yahweh. We don't know his heritage. Something I learned was that prophets can be from any tribe. There wasn't anything specific to, uh, to where they could come from. Some were from the northern kingdom, some were from the southern. So, But we don't know a lot about Obadiah. Almost every prophet, um, they will give you their last name. I found out when you see something like son of so-and-so, then that gives you information about their heritage and their father's name or the descendant. Uh, sometimes it wasn't their father. It could have been a grandfather or a great-grandfather. But it's a marker that is attached to that person as a surname. So it gives you a lot of information. Now... There are 12 Obadiahs referenced biblically, so we don't know which Obadiah this is. We don't know about his heritage. We don't know who his father or his descendants were. And as I was considering that, I thought, you know what? That's really interesting. It's as if he maybe wanted to stay anonymous. Maybe he didn't want us to know, or maybe that wasn't God's plan for us today to know if he was pre-exilic, exilic, or post-exilic. And I think what happens in that kind of situation is the message is broader. It can be applied more fully and uh, throughout a whole era, um, even more to us today because we don't know a whole lot. It's almost like when Paul, you know, with Paul and his thorn in his side, we don't know what that thorn actually was, but I'm kind of glad we don't because you know, we, there's people who have guesses, but we don't know specifically. We can't be dogmatic about it. And the beautiful thing about that is, is that we can then apply it in our lives. Just seems like a whole lot easier. So that's just an interesting, interesting things about Obadiah. Um, this letter was written to the, to the Edomites, but we don't actually know if it was written strictly to Edom or if it was uh, written and given to the people of Israel. We don't really know. But it sent me on a whole journey about who exactly is Edom. Edom were physically located in the southern right side, the east side, kind of below Judah and Benjamin off to the off to the corner physically. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, they were the descendants of Esau. Descendants of Esau were brothers of Jacob, God's chosen people. Their parents were Isaac and Rachel. They were twins, if you guys remember that. 
And so um, Edom lost their birthright and their blessing to Jacob. And when uh, the Israelites were wandering through the desert and they were trying to get into the promised land, there was, a, there was a point in time when they could have passed through Edom and the Edomites said no. They did not let them do that. And so that is in Numbers 20, 14 through 21. There's just so much history here with these two tribes uh, and these two people groups. And so something to know about Edom is that they were often going back and forth between uh, being subjugated or controlled by by the kingdom of the south, by King David, by King Jer Jeroham, by King Amaziah. Um, so they were often revolting, rebelling, conquered, revol revolting, rebelling, conquered. So there was just like a lot of animosity. And what this book is telling them, what Obadiah is telling them, is that um, the main message is Yahweh is going to take back his kingdom. Um, so there is judgment coming, but there's also hope and encouragement. So he wants us to know, um, that the proud and the oppressors, like what you do to others, that's going to be done to you. And he wants God's people to know that I see you and I will fully restore you shortly in this time period, but also eschatologically, which is a big fancy word for like more like end times, in the final judgment, there's this, this understanding of accountability and restoration fully is coming. And the beautiful thing about that, to keep this message short, because it's already getting long, the beautiful message in that is that now today in our life, we can take hold of that and realize like we can forgive and we can let things go in our life without bitterness, knowing that God in the end is going to make all things right. He brings hope. He brings restoration. He sees us. Those that have done wrong in the end, um, the judgment is coming. That might happen in this lifetime or the next, you know? So, uh, but it's just nice to know that like God is in control. He is sovereign. He is our compassionate reconciler and he will make all things right. We don't have to worry about it. And when we realize that we can let go we can forgive. We don't have to be bitter. We don't have to hold on to hatred towards a certain person or people group or situation. We can let it go knowing that God is in control and that God will make all things right and that he will restore and that he will bring hope and that he will give us peace. And we can find peace in that now, even before those events actually happen, even before we see things play out and knowing that we might not, we might not get to see that. It might not be for us to see, but we can still take rest in knowing that God is in control, that he loves his children, that he never forgets them and that he is going to take care of us. So that's kind of the short message of Obadiah. It is a short book, but it is packed with both judgment and hope and encouragement because Obadiah wanted whoever read this in whatever time period it was read to know that. He wanted them to know you have an opportunity to be transformed. Are you going to take this message and let it saturate you and let it change the way you think? Because that's how real change and real restoration begins. Repent, know that judgment is coming, and know that if you do repent, then, man, blessings upon blessings and wonderful things will be coming your way because you will be in a right relationship with God. All right, that's the short of it. Uh, this message was nine minutes long. That's longer than what I wanted, but hopefully you enjoy it and get something out of it.